Hi, and welcome back to Maturing the Bride. We are in book number six. And in book number six, we're trying to ask a very simple question, and that is this. How is God going to choose his bride? In chapter one, we learned about J1 and J2. All Christians are going to be judged twice. And these two judgments have two different purposes. J1 is focused on your faith, whereas J2 is focused on your works. We then went to chapter 2 and found 10 differences between J1 and J2. J1 is a one-time event, whereas J2 is ongoing. J1 is unconditional. J2 is conditional. J1 is a child of God. J2 is a friend of God. J1 is faith. J2 is faithfulness. J1 is an heir of God. J2 is co-heir with Christ. J1 is in Christ. J2 is abiding in Christ. J1 is unworthy, J2 is worthy. J1 is walking in the flesh, J2 is walking in the spirit. J1 is free, J2 is costly. J1 is instant forgiveness, whereas J2 is daily forgiveness. We then went to chapter 3, and we asked the question, will my sin come up at J2? And we found out in J1, our sin will never be brought up. It's separated as far as the east is from the west. But at J2, we found out that no confessed sin will be brought up. That brings us now to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, we're asking a different question. What criteria will God use to judge us at J2? I want to suggest to you, men and women, that there are seven criteria that God will use at J2. Seven criteria that God is going to use to look at our lives and make an assessment. Those criteria are, number one, our motivation. Number two, our faithfulness. Number three, our wholehearted service. Number four, our deeds. Number five, our words. Number six, our thoughts. And number seven, our opportunities. Let's start at the first one, our motivation. Men and women, you and I know that there can be wrong motivations in serving Christ. Even some pastors can have wrong motivations. And the scriptures warn us about this. We find this in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Notice the motivation. To draw away the disciples after them. Translated in today's terms, they want big churches. They want big churches. They want mega churches. They want to be the man in charge of a mega church. Deep down in their heart, they're basically saying, I want it to all be about me. And so we have to ask the question, whose kingdom is this about? Is it about their kingdom or is it about God's kingdom? John writes about those who think it's about themselves. In 3 John verses 9 and 10, we read these words. I have written something to the church. But Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Who likes to put himself first? Yep, it's a quest for power. There are pastors whose quest is for power, not serving the king, but serving themselves. It goes on. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Puts them out of the church? Yeah, they're pastoring churches. Did you catch those words, pastoring churches? This is a person who's pastoring a church. They're inside the church. They're leading the church. This is not someone from the outside. This is someone from the inside. And they're kicking others out of the church. Jesus warned us about this in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no rewards from your Father who is in heaven. There are some people who are practicing righteousness to be seen by others. It's not about God's kingdom. It's about their kingdom. Their motivation is all wrong. God will judge our motivations. Look at 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. 
then each one will receive his commendation from God. Will disclose the purposes of the heart. God's going to look at your heart motivation and my heart motivation. What were you living for? Was it for your kingdom or my kingdom? Which one was it? And that will determine our rewards. Well, what should our motivations be? Well, he tells the Corinthians, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Do everything for the glory of God. He also says, 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. There are various motivations. Do it for the glory of God. Do it in love and store it for yourselves. If you do those things, you're on good ground. You're on good ground. So number one, our motivations. Number two, our faithfulness. We've seen this multiple times, 1 Corinthians 4.2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Men and women, if you want a positive assessment at J2, be faithful in your life to the Lord. Be faithful in your singleness. Be faithful in your marriage. Be faithful in your homework. Be faithful at work. Be faithful in parenting. Be faithful in every area of your life. Hence, Luke 19, verse 17, as God is looking at the minas that he gave him, he said, I want to see how you did. We read these words. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. Faithfulness is what he was looking for. Same in Matthew 25. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Same in Revelation 2.10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful unto death. Why? Why is God so worried about our faithfulness? Well, because of these words, Luke 16.10. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And the one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in very much. Men and women, God has a kingdom he wants to give to us as his bride. And he says, I want to see if you're going to be faithful. If you're faithful on the earth, I'm going to give you a lot of responsibility in heaven. If you're not, I'm going to take it away and give it to somebody else. God is going to look at our faithfulness. Okay, so we've looked at that one. Let's look at the third one. Our wholehearted service to God, men and women. God doesn't want half-hearted service. God doesn't want half-hearted service. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Obey them, not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord and not people. Here he's talking to slaves, and he says, I want you to serve your masters wholeheartedly. That's a sign to God. If you do that, well... God knows you're going to do it for me well. You're at the office, and you're not serving at the office wholeheartedly. You're just getting by. God's watching. He doesn't want that. He says, I'm preparing you. I'm testing you to see if you're going to serve me wholeheartedly. I want to see how you're doing at your job. If you do well at your job, you're going to do well for me wholeheartedly. Colossians chapter 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Work with all your heart. And we see this in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Fully committed to him. God's looking. He's going over the whole earth. He's looking for people whose hearts are fully committed to him. Jeremiah 3, yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, declares the Lord. Did not return to me with her whole heart. God wants wholehearted service. Hey, listen, why would God trust his family business to someone who wasn't fully committed? That doesn't make any sense. If you're not fully committed on the earth, why should he give you a place in his family business to rule and to reign forever? He's not going to. He wants wholehearted 
service to himself. Let's go to the next one. Our deeds. We know this. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Done in the body. Those are deeds. Those are deeds. Revelation 22.12. I love to misquote this. This is a misquote. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for his theology. You don't get rewarded for your theology. That's not what the text says. Notice what else it doesn't say. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for how many times he attended church. Nope. It's not what it says. What does it say? Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has what? Done. For what he has done. God is going to reward our deeds. He's looking to see what kind of rewards we're going to have. Matthew 16, 27, same thing. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. He's coming. He's coming again, and he's going to reward us for what we have done. Oh, J1, that's how we get to heaven? No, 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 no. J1 is faith. He's talking about J2 works. Men and women, this is not a New Testament phenomena. You'll find it all throughout the Old Testament as well on your works. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Psalm 62, 12. And that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deed. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 10. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. Okay, we've looked at deeds. Let's go on to the next one. He's going to judge us for our words. Men and women, you may have heard the phrase, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, we all know that's a lie. <laughs> Men and women, my deepest hurt came from my spiritual father. My spiritual father hurt me deeply. In fact, he gave me the deepest hurt of my life. Words hurt. They can hurt deeply. Hence, Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. God says in his word, I want you to build people up. I want you to encourage them, to strengthen them, and to make them more like me with your words. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words they will be justified and by your words they will be condemned. He says, you're gonna be held accountable for your words. And your careless words, if they're unconfessed, you'll be held accountable for them. Luke chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. It's going to happen. If it's not been confessed, it will be dealt with. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. God is going to look at our words, and he's going to judge us. He's going to say, these words were hurtful. These words encourage. If the hurtful words have been confessed, it'll never be brought up at J2. Live a lifestyle of repentance. Ask people for forgiveness. Won't be brought up at J2. Okay, he's going to judge our words. Number six, he's going to be looking at our thoughts. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, 
and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Discerning the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. Hmm. He's going to be looking at all of our thoughts. That's what he's communicating. And the word of God is like a sword. It'll cut right through it. He'll look at our motivations and the thoughts of us. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We're going to give an account. Everything, all of our thoughts. Romans 2, 14 to 16. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. He's going to judge the secrets of men. He's going to judge our inner thoughts, our inner words that are inside of our hearts, inside of our minds. Men and women, our goal should be perfection. That's our goal. Now we're never going to reach it. And so we just keep confessing, living a lifestyle of repentance. Exhale, inhale, take back control, living a lifestyle like that. If we do that, won't be brought up at J2. But he's going to look at everything. Hence, he says, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Every thought captive is what he wants for us. Don't think about that. Think about other things. What does he say to think about? Philippians 4. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Men and women, God is going to be judging our thoughts. Men and women, God is going to be judging our thoughts. And he says, I told you what to think about. Think about the good things. Focus on that. God is going to be judging our thoughts. Finally, our opportunities. You know, I love a passage about Jonathan in the Old Testament. Jonathan, with his arm bare, says, hey, let's go check out this Philistine camp and let's see what God does we find it in 1 Samuel 14, verse 1. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Verse 6. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. It may be. Jonathan didn't know what was going to happen. Jonathan wasn't sure whether God was going to give him favor and victory or whether he was going to be defeated. But he said, let's go do this for God. These men are uncircumcised. They're not of the relationship with the Lord. God may give us victory. He did not know, but he took a step of faith. He went out and took hold of an opportunity that was there and he grabbed it for the Lord. Jonathan wasn't sure, but he did it anyhow. Look at Titus 2.14, talking about Jesus who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. Men and women, I believe that God had said, hey, do you want to do good works for me? Let's see. What do you got? Show me your stuff. Sometimes he has specific things for us to do. Other times he says, hey, I've given you a lot of opportunities. Let me see what you can do. Let me see what you can do. I've given you opportunities. Are you going to take them up for my kingdom or for your kingdom? Hebrews 10 verse 24. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. God is going to look at our opportunities, our opportunities to serve him. Seven criteria that God is going to use to judge us. Number one, our motivations. Number two, our faithfulness. Number three, our wholehearted service. Number four, our deeds. Number five, our words. Number six, our thoughts. And number seven, our opportunities.
Okay, we're not going to look for Waldo. We're going to look for the J's. Where are the J's? We've got three passages. Here is passage number one, Romans chapter seven, verse four. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Do you see it? Five, four, three, two, one. J1, you have also died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. That's all J1. What's the purpose? In order that we may bear fruit for God. J2. Pretty clear now, isn't it? Passage number two. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Five, four, three, two, one. It's a short passage. J1. For by a single offering, he has perfected all time. Perfected. J1. Completely clean. Those who are being sanctified. J2. It's a process. Becoming holy. Passage number three. 2 Timothy 2.10. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Five, four, three, two, one. J1. That they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Rewards. J2. Hope you're seeing these. Okay. Let's review. God will be judging us at J2. He'll be using seven criteria. Number one is our motivation. Number two is our faithfulness. Number three, our wholehearted service to him. Number four, our deeds. Number five, our words. Number six, our thoughts. And number seven, our opportunities. Hopefully that will help you live a life so that when you stand before him at J2 and become fully assessed, you'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Okay, in our next time together, we're going to be discussing what Paul did not know about those he wrote to. In other words, the people and the letters in Romans and Corinthians, there's some things he didn't know about them, therefore he was writing in a certain way. Or another way of saying it is, what Paul did not know about you or me. You're going to love this one. Thank you for watching Maturing the Bride. Hey everyone, I hope J1 and J2 has been extremely helpful for you. I know it has helped many people over the years that I've taught it to, and I certainly know it has helped me. <laughs> Just as a reminder, it is a part of a bigger series called Maturing the Bride. Please be sure you watch the other books to help you get the big picture of what God is doing. And always remember, Unveiling Glory is a 501c3 nonprofit organization seeking to have a global impact on the church. If you want to help get the message of J1 and J2 out to other nations, please consider giving a tax-free donation to keep spreading this message and to keep this teaching free. Go to www.givetoug.com. Thanks, and please pass this message on to others.